thanks very much. And I'd like to thank Ian for a um, fabulous um, majority of the session. Actually, it's been easy for me. Um, but uh, I'll just quickly reflect on my background. So my background is in the School of Public Health in research predominantly, and I'm a clinical general practitioner and an occupational medicine practitioner with many years in the military. And, and that really piqued my interest in the issue of systems and bias. Um, related to diagnosis and many other factors as well. Um, so, so my research is mainly focused around the issue of building systems which are resilient um, to deal with um, a whole range of factors, including clinicians and their biases. Um, and so, so what I'd like to do is just touch on some of the, what I consider to be the realities of the situation. I think we're all aware of them. I'm a realist when it comes to systems and clinicians. Um, we talk about uh, and spent the most of this session talking about how individually uh, biases can play out and potentially we've thought about individually as we've reflected on the cases how we might reduce those biases by various personal strategies but but what about the the issue of reducing those biases at a systems level and potentially reframing the question as having systems which actually can tolerate the fact that clinicians come from a human population not a robot population and that they are inherently biased due to their human nature um, and so and so I think this will touch on some interesting new thinking when it comes to safety uh, that I'd like to reflect and uh, and commend to you um, so the reality of workplaces including clinical ones uh, is that workers often develop a need to use what I would call workarounds to get the job done um, and so in many cases we have a what I would call a social and technical system called medicine that we are trained in we have a management uh, system that we learn about when we go to hospital. Uh, we're, we're, we're inculcated into a way of thinking, a way of behaving, a way of operating and a way of in being employed in a particular system that it demands on us a particular way of doing things. But that often doesn't actually accord with reality. In many cases, uh, when we're in difficult to manage settings, uh, that would be after hours potentially, where you're a junior doctor, you may not have those experiences, you, you are expected to manage that particular situation. And so uh, I reflect on my, my training where I felt that that was a good thing to be as creative as I could to solve those problems. Whereas I reflect on some of my colleagues who found that incredibly challenging. And the system did not accommodate them. And the system wasn't ready to accommodate them and they were blamed. Blamed for errors in diagnosis and many other things because it was easier to do that than reflect on the system that put them there in the first place. So, so the reality is that we all differ significantly in what we actually do in our day-to-day -day jobs to what we intend to do and what we perceive we intend to do and what other people expect us to do. Uh, and this has now been formalised, and I commend to you the references at the bottom of the page, Holnagel, Braithwaite and Weirs, uh, a, a publication uh, titled Resilient Healthcare, and the concept raised by Holnagel of Safety 1 and Safety 2, which I'll touch on a little bit more in this particular discussion. And the issue is that clinicians, are, in my opinion, are often left carrying liability risks for both systems factors and clinician factors. And, and, and I'm sure many of you have felt that criticism of a management of a particular case has been grossly unfair because you were placed in that situation through a whole lot of factors outside of your personal control. So where, what do we mean when we say we want to reduce um, bias and cognitive, cognitive bias and diagnostic error? What do we mean by that? Do we mean that we're going to have a, have a process that reduces bias at an individual level, or are we going to think about the systems factors that lead situations to be prone to those kind of errors? And I think that um, when we think about the epidemiology that was already presented by Ian earlier, we can see that systems errors account for a large percentage of the causes of diagnostic error. And so, and so what are we doing about that? And that's what I would like to uh, relate to you. So what are the characteristics of high risk and low error organisations? And, I, uh, and I'll commend to you some of those as examples. Nuclear power reactors, for example. Uh, high end military uh, operations such as special forces. Uh, aircraft manufacture. 
What, what are the characteristics of those organisations that lead them to be so effective and efficient but uh, that uh, also have low error? Uh, because they have to do that. So they've had been forced to uh, develop systems which are actually able to uh, manage the risks. And those systems are characterised, and those organisers are, are characterised by feedback mechanisms that actually deal with errors and identify systems errors and, and manage them, increase the scope for error that naturally occurs with the human <coughs> factors introduced into the organisation. So that when they do occur, and they inevitably, inevitably will occur, because human beings are human beings, and you'll have your next trainee and they'll have to learn, it, it actually accommodates that rather than actually punishes it. So let's talk about safety one and two. So safety one and two are relatively new concepts being developed over probably about 15 years in the formal research literature. Um, and safety one refers to what I thank our paediatrician friend from uh, I think Sydney um, for mentioning, a focus on error and reducing error. So safety one is our traditional approach to um, to a, 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 an issue that might cause a harm in an organisation. So you might have a one in 10,000 risk of a particular error occurring historically. Uh, that's based on the information you have. And we want to reduce that even further. Another good example being zero harm on the roads. Okay? What that doesn't factor is actually where things went right and why the number is as low as it is when you think about the flip side, that means that 9,999 9 times it's actually gone right. And, when I, and I would like you to reflect on the issue of work as intended versus work, versus work as done. So the thinking goes that actually the human involvement in these clinical systems, in other safety systems, is actually the determining factor for why things go right. As, and a great example being that febrile child out of the sea of febrile children that was picked out. Why, why did that go right? And, and it doesn't get documented, nor does it get investigated, and there's very little research that's done on these particular factors, and that's something that needs to change. So how can you start to frame uh, an understanding of how systems actually involve human factors. Uh, Holgate, Holnagel has developed a new way of looking at it. It takes uh, Swiss cheese to a new level of complexity, um, but it's a functional resonance analysis methodology. I commend that to you to have a look at it. It's available online as a website. And it, and it, and it is touching on a general safety methodology called resilience engineering, of which Holnagel has published uh, resilience healthcare, which is the healthcare angle on this. And it is widely recognised that resilient healthcare is actually the pinnacle of complex safety systems I do reflect on. Now old commentary from the United States that healthcare is up to 30, 30 to 35 times more complex than the most complex military systems. That's very old uh, commentary, but I think valid. So can we design clinical systems to be designed that naturally tolerate a degree of clinician bias? And can we avoid the harms related for them by designing systems that either pick it up or actually tolerate it, or potentially even, which is a novel concept, that it actually works to the favour of the patient? For example, we need to take into account variations in experience. Like I mentioned, novice practitioners, being our junior doctors, to experts, being yourselves, we're all prone to bias, but the junior doctors are at significantly increased risk in the system that may not be willing to accommodate them or set to accommodate them. Variations in diagnostic approach and abilities. The idea of unwarranted clinical variation, which I find is an interesting terminology. Um, so how do you define unwarranted versus warranted clinical variation? Because I actually think there is warranted clinical variation in our approaches and that it's not necessarily the right thing to be all carbon copies of each other in how we approach a patient. And, our, and necessarily our diagnostic approach. We bring uh, far more than a procedural approach to our patients. Then harmless versus harmful cognitive bias and differentiating those from each other and avoidance of no-win situations. Can we design a system where even when it's in error, it's a win for the patient? So when you design your clinical systems, uh, a medical administrator friend here, and, and, and being the director of health management, this is an active research discussion I have with our, our postgraduate students. Can we design systems so that there isn't a loss, that even in error, it's a win? And so that really touches on the fact that we're all humans, and we need to embrace that. 
and I feel that our clinical systems are becoming far too black and white, uh, rigid in our approach and, and inflexible when it comes to dealing with the realities of humans and, and perhaps, dare I say, not a very pleasant place to work in um, if we're constantly trying to backflip to make something which is unimplementable implemented. Um, so I leave this as a question to you all, um, something to reflect on and please to uh, please refer to these references which I um, uh, really come from researchers which I very much respect, um, Geoffrey Braithwaite being at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation uh, and widely respected on this particular topic. Um, are we going to actually embrace humanity and humanistic approaches to our patients rather than having a compliance and assurance driven approach where we punish variation and we punish error even when it might actually have been not error and more ben and beneficial for the patient. So and a, a, a call and a request to, the, to, to you as a group um, to think perhaps a little bit differently about what, how things went right with your patient population rather than what went wrong. And I'm more than happy to take questions about this topic because it's interesting. David, thank you. It's, uh, we will have time for one or two questions. It's really good to be reminded that care occurs in a systems context. And, and like you, I highly recommend Geoffrey Braithwaite's group's writings on, on Safety 1, Safety 2. The, the shift from compliance-based models to genuine improvement-based models is profoundly important, but it's one that our health systems in this country, at least, are yet to catch up with. One or two quick questions, and then we'll close the session. Brett. Uh, thanks, words. Brett Forge. Great session, by the way. We could have done another hour, I think. Um, just one of the things that's really changed in the last 10 or 15 years, in my experience, is this explosion of algorithms. And everything's managed with an algorithm. And I uh, assume it's designed to improve outcomes. My impression is it stops people thinking and they make more mistakes. What are your thoughts about this, and is it the right way to go? Uh, I would agree. And so, um, so it is not like flying a plane, and it is not like um, it is not like manufacturing a widget, um, our jobs. It is complex with complex factors, with un un unanticipated interactions. So algorithms that are blindly applied will, I think, uh, I dare to use the word um, always, uh, but very often fail um, because we have such significant variability in the context in which we would apply that. And so this is one of the concerns I have with evidence-based medicine, also blindly applied. Um, you have to be careful how you select, selectively use that, and there are other factors involved. So thank you. I agree. Last question to a former president, Liz Blythe. I, I have a, perhaps a comment and question to you. We have a selection bias. We get a patient with chest pain, we send them to an interventional cardiologist. They get a cardiac cath, it's clear. Great. Win-win. We send a colonoscopy a patient to a colonoscopist, they have a colonoscopy, it's clear, win-win. How do we get over that selection bias? That goes back to our diagnostic reasoning at the beginning to select the patient, but that really leads to a, a, a different set of biases in the, in the pathway. Yeah. Look, I, I, I agree. And so really what I was, when we're talking about these particular things, we do naturally focus on, on negative events. And when we talk about what went right, we haven't got the frameworks and all language to actually articulate that well. We think about what went right in terms of the patient who came back with a null result or came back with the answer to our diagnostic question, either you know fully supporting that and then everything goes swimmingly. It's really questions where there's those those uh, those questions of um, of difficult to manage cases, or where there's a high risk of other complex factors coming in. So I think simple simple clinical cases where we're talking about fairly linear processes are, are um, not really where I think a lot of the work needs to be focused. I think a lot of the work in terms of our systems need to be needs to be really selectively focused towards where there's complexity by virtue of uncertainty. Yeah.